Okay, so for chapter 8, uh, we are only going to focus upon the first section which applies to small groups for the purposes of this class. And uh, so the, uh, the slides you're going to be looking at apply specifically to that particular issue. Now small groups, it's interesting the topic itself because it really kind of looks at groups from two different ways, one of which is sort of the therapeutic uh, angle on groups and how um, how you make use of groups perhaps in social work. Although I, I must say it's a very very superficial look at that and this is indeed you know a subject that is very much worth several semesters of study. Uh, but also uh, the text looks at groups in terms of our interactions with other individuals on a day-to-day -day basis in non-therapeutic settings as well. And so, so it covers a lot of material in, in really just a, a small amount of pages. So by just as a forewarning, this is going to be a relatively superficial look at this topic. Small groups um, is defined here as two or more people who interact with each other because of shared interests, shared goals, experiences, or needs. Uh, a lot of the kinds of things that we do in our life takes place in small groups and it might be just simply sitting down and you know having a lunch or sharing a beer with some friends or something like this. It might be that we're working on a project together uh, whether it be in our uh, private life or in our professional life. Self-help groups sports teams and other kinds of activities. All of these types of um, interactions with other people is what could be considered to be a small group. And the groups have a function of providing social support. Um, sometimes they provide socialization into the norms of society depending upon the particular type of group we're in. Uh, they give us a sense of belonging to others. Um, companionship and connections to the wider world. The small groups have uh, the group work has got um, early foundations in the field of social work. When you go back to the days of uh, the settlement houses and Jane Addams and uh, other settlement houses, uh, the ones that she established as well as other people, uh, group work was a particular mode of intervention there rather than individual intervention which had been the the trend up until that time you know with individual casework kind of using the medical model and seeing the individual as um, a patient to be fixed and to help find ways to function more successfully in society the settlement house had the notion of working with people to empower them to uh, change society, basically. And this was done through a number of different methods, including recreation and teaching language and, um, you know, studying contracts and those kinds of things together. But the idea was to tap into the strengths of the individuals, even though they were having difficulties functioning in society, and to use those strengths to to uh, change the circumstances rather than seeing the, the person as a as a, a deficient individual more or less. So so early group social work took place in these settlement houses and community centers. Nowadays group work is more favored. You know really group work fell out of favor um, to a certain extent uh, around the time of the uh, the progressive era individual casework became more popular because in the first part of the 1900s, in the late 1800s and first part of the 1900s, socialism was really becoming more and more influential around the world. And in fact, in national American elections, you know, socialist candidates were, were doing quite well. And this was um, seen as a bit of a challenge to the to the capitalists uh, that were in charge of the of, of our economic environment in those days. And so um, particularly when the Bolsheviks uh, took over in Russia, the socialist movement in Russia, there was a lot of concern about socialism. And ultimately, this is one of the ways that if you ever heard about social work being associated with communism, you know, this is one of the reasons why social work had been seen for quite a period of time as being a bit of a suspect profession uh, because of the fact that 
that uh, these group workers were out there working with these uh, immigrants and, and uh, individuals who are already thought to be spreading socialism in, in the United States. And here they are trying to empower these individuals to change society. So, so they were seen with a great deal of suspicion, you know. And so group work really fell out of favor in the profession itself. The profession, I think, kind of in survival mode, decided to focus upon individual casework as the mode of operation, more or less. And, and it really wasn't until probably the 1960s, I think, when and group work and community organization began to become more popular once again. Um, so in any event, today, even in the therapeutic setting, your group work uh, is a great way to do services. But uh, a lot of the reasons that your, your employers want you to do group work if you're working for uh, private agencies and nonprofits or for-profits is because it's financially prudent to work with a number of people uh, in a uh, in a particular therapeutic intervention rather than seeing everybody individually. And so from the standpoint of, uh, of economics, you know, your employers tend to like groups, insurance companies like groups. Um, and not to say that they're not effective because the studies have shown that uh, group effectiveness, group treatment is, is, is quite effective in addressing a number of human problems. Now here's a, this is, of course, in the text, and it's a matrix that kind of breaks out different types of groups uh, and kind of tells you the similarities and differences of those groups across several different dimensions, including the group purpose, uh, what kind of leadership they have, the size of the group typically, how long they usually last, and, and give you some examples of the different kinds of groups in each category. As you see, therapy groups is only one of, of different kinds of groups, and I'm sure there are more types than, than these five with a little bit of thought. But uh, uh, in the course of your work, my guess is, is that in your career, you're going to have involvement with each of these five groups and, and uh, in, in the different kind of settings that you encounter clients. There, another kind of a new topic, of course, in group work are virtual groups. and. And of course, this means that members don't don't meet face to face in the the traditional sense. Perhaps face to face uh, is accomplished through Skype or uh, you know uh, FaceTime or something like that. But traditionally speaking, virtual groups don't um, don't meet face to face. And so there's a lot of talk about telephone social work in this particular chapter, and and individuals who are shut in and who can't move around and those kinds of things. This is something that's pretty beneficial. I think you know it it, it can help. Uh, caregivers, uh, frail older adults who can't be left alone, those kinds of things. And an interesting comment that this uh, author makes is is that you know that there are studies that show that there's more more cohesiveness in in uh, telephone virtual groups than in face to face groups. Perhaps because there's no focus upon uh, the physical features and differences and and the cues that we all send off that might might cause us to judge one another. But, of course, the lack of these cues can also lead to misunderstandings and communications as we can't read body language and that kinds of things in, the, in these situations. I uh, remember when telephone therapy was not considered to be very valid. And, and I think, frankly, that you're going to find that a lot of uh, the, the people who pay individuals in therapy uh, won't pay for telephone therapy. You know, a lot of insurance companies would not. Likewise, with uh, groups over the internet, you know, you um, there are commercials for services such as Talkspace, I believe, and those kinds of things. Where actually, that's communication and therapy via text. Which, uh, well, you could have a text group as well, I suppose. You know, it's uh, there's all sorts of things emerging in terms of uh, you know the virtual network as far as therapy goes. But uh, um, most of these outfits that are offering these these types of interventions uh, you know guarantee that the professionals that you're speaking with a the therapist that you're encountering have have credentials but again uh, a lot of them um, I think probably most of them right now are not being paid for by insurance companies they they say that uh, some of the sites if you look at them they'll tell you that your weekly fee for these services um, you know, probably going to be less than, you may be less than your copay if you had insurance. I don't know if that's true or not. Depends on your insurance, I suppose. But, but um, again, for people at a distance who can't travel or have physical limitations, um, the, this, these kinds of interventions might be useful. But, 
you know, there are the pluses and the minuses of these, organi uh, of these uh, interactions, just like is mentioned as far as telephone groups are concerned. And, and you know, the other thing is, is that you have to be very cautious about the fact that, that it's easy for individuals to make up an identity and to interact with others in, in, in sort of an avatar kind of a way. And, um, you know, so you never really know quite what you're getting if you're talking to other people uh, in, in settings such as this. So concerns about privacy, boundaries, confidentiality, all those kinds of things should be monitored very closely in these groups. Now, when we talk about group structure, structure the, uh, the authors talk about three dimensions of group stu structure. That is how they developed. Are they formed for a purpose or do they occur naturally? Do they just kind of evolve and, and happen from, from situ some situation? Or is somebody, you know, post an advertisement that we're going to have a group and it's going to meet at such and such a time? How long do they last? Some groups are time limited. Others kind of go on indefinitely with uh, no endpoint to find and also how do we determine membership are they open groups where members come and go uh, and can be added at any time or are they closed groups where you know persons start and finish together and each of them have a you know have a um, a valid usefulness depending upon the type of group you also have to look at group composition another part about group structure which is are they are they heterogeneous that is um, a whole group of different kinds of characteristics among its members. Um, so so a, a general therapy group, for instance, you know, uh, the, I suppose the thing that is in common among all the individuals is that they have some sort of concern or another, but there might be a mixture of people with, uh, if you're looking at diagnoses with different diagnostic impressions, you know, uh, there could be differences in ages and, and gender and all sorts of things, or they could be homogeneous where they're women's group or men's groups um, and so on. So um, group composition can vary and again it depends upon the particular goal of the group as to which is preferable. Heterogeneous groups are apt to in particular apt to replicate power structures of the outside world and so as a, as a leader in such a group you should be very attentive to this and, and to watch for that in group process and and challenges necessary, you know, so that uh, sometimes individuals that, that are in an oppressed group in, in the outside world may, may also find themselves in a one down position in the groups, powerful people, um, people who are even uh, maybe abusive individuals, you know, can begin to act out some of those same types of behaviors in a group setting. And so the, the uh, professional needs to be prepared to intervene and, and uh, call that out when it occurs. Now, group cohesiveness is a part of the group process that's also something that's very important. And, and a cohesive group really can make a lot of progress that uh, an uncohesive group would not make. So this is uh, the tendency of the group to stick together and to be unified in its pursuit of its objectives and also um, to be good at satisfying the emotional needs of the members. And in, in most cases, even, even groups that are not therapy groups, uh, task groups, oftentimes there are emotional needs that members bring to the group and a cohesive group is gonna recognize and deal with that as well. You'll see higher rates of attendance in cohesive groups, uh, uh, regular attendance and participation and, and a supportive kind of relationship that develops between the members. Um, and, and both task groups and therapy groups are shown to be more effective uh, if there is group cohesion. And so it behooves the leader of the group, the professional involved, if, if it's a professional, uh, to um, you know, actively try to promote cohesiveness in the group. But conflict and dislikes still can occur even in, in, in uh, cohesive groups. And one of the things that uh, it's a feature that, uh, again, you know, this really requires a lot more, a lot more attention than, than we're going to give it here. But, you know, it's the concept of coalitions in a group when, when certain, uh, you know, a few members of a group kind of split off and sort of form their own group with their own dynamic and, and really um, have their own objectives their own purposes and they really don't they're not not really engaged in in pursuing the objectives of the groups anymore as they're pursuing their own objectives and it can become very destructive to group process and undermine cohesion a great deal so that's a, uh, something to 
leader, and it's not unusual to occur either. So something leaders need to um, need to pay attention to. The the unique interactions between group members that result from being in a group together is called the group process. And frankly, you know, group group cohesion is something. I mean. Um, yeah, cohesion and, and coalitions and those kinds of things are a part of, the, of that process. But uh, there are also uh, other th major theories of group process that we're going to look at here, five different theories. The first one is psychodynamic theory, which, you know, is a popular theory across all of our subjects this semester. Um, and in, in group process, psychodynamic theory focuses on the relationship between the unconscious emotional processes of an individual or the group members, I should say, and the rational kind of a conscious processes of, of the interpersonal interactions in the group. And the, this theory holds that understanding the emotional processes in a group, that is the unconscious emotional processes, is essential for accomplishing a group's task. And this is particularly important to therapy group. You're going to probably focus less on this in task groups, in most task groups at least. And, you know, but perhaps in self-help groups, this would, although self-help groups don't tend to have uh, professional leadership, there certainly is, uh, you know, psychodynamic processes going on in self-help groups. And hopefully the whoever is leading these, uh, you know, self-help groups will, um, you know, will be able to have enough um, expertise to, to be able to monitor and deal with some of the stuff that may surface. But, you know, we when we're in small groups, that you know, we have a need to belong. And that's one of the things that small groups um, – really uh, really help to provide but at the same time you know the the groups have the potential to arouse our concerns about acceptance and and our social competence and things like this and so there's a lot of stuff going on in groups that that leader needs to be aware of but there are these broad assumptions that are mentioned here for psychodynamic theory at least for understanding small groups and that is first that the emotional unconscious processes are always present, they're always being acted out in the group, uh, that they affect the quality of the interpersonal communication and the ability to accomplish the task of the group, um, and that the effectiveness of the group then depends upon bringing those unconscious emotional processes to the group members' conscious awareness. You know, you, you can't really... Uh, you can't really deal with those things if they're going on all the time unless you're aware of them on a certain level. And so it's, it's, uh, this is where I think the professional leader comes, in, comes in, into play. Many times you'll be able to help the members to see how their interactions with the group um, really kind of play out the same kind of interactions they have with, with other significant persons in their life. Symbolic interaction theory also talks about group process. You know, I, having spent several years teaching introductory sociology courses, s symbolic interaction was one of the three um, uh, uh, perspectives in sociology, you know, in terms of understanding the world. And, and on the one hand, it's, it's, it seems to be pretty abstract when you start talking about symbols and, you know, words or symbols and those kinds of things. But, what you know, when you think about, uh, how does it play out in real life? You know, there's some pretty dramatic examples. The one uh, that I always thought was the most obvious uh, was, you know, tent revivals. If you've ever been to a revival meeting, first of all, the tent itself, even if it's a large tent, kind of creates this uh, enclosure around people that, that uh, I think emphasize the closeness, you know, kind of make people feel like, you know, they're, they're much closer to each other than they might if it was in an open environment. Um, uh, even like, you know, if you've ever been in the dome, which I understand is, you know, seen better days, but in the dome in Anchorage, uh, you know, even in that large enclosure, you still have a sense that, you know, you're closed off from the rest of the world in there. It's a whole different, literally a different atmosphere. And so you have that thing going on and you have a bunch of people that are in this in this tent that, you know, share a, a purpose for being there. You know, they, they have probably some religious uh, reason to be there, you know, in a revival, and and um, they're hoping for certain things to happen, and uh, they're sitting pretty close together, you know, so they all have this mutual interest, and 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 then they they have a a, a speaker or a leader who is very dynamic, and and maybe has 
crippled people come up and he lays his hands on them and they couldn't walk before, but they get up and they walk. Everybody in the room is just amazed and thrilled to see this happen. And they're very excited about this. And, and their excitement translates to the person next to them who gets excited. And the first person sees this excitement around him and becomes more excited. And, you know, it becomes almost something of a frenzy of, of excitement and 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 hallelujahs and all those kinds of things. That is symbolic interaction theory. It's that circular impact of how we it, we affect each other. And through the symbols that uh, religion and all those other kinds of things bring to our life. And so in, in a group setting, the same kind of thing can happen in a small group as might happen in a revival. I mean, that's a large group. By the same way, symbols are created and exchanged and interpreted. And the, the group really kind of works through all of this change that's happened. Uh, and specific meanings are developed in those groups and, and changed through the use of symbols. Their actions impact each other vice versa, just like they would in a revival meeting. So the symbols that are used in a group and the meaning that are made of those symbols are influenced by the environments in which the group is embedded. But but at the same time, it creates its own environment and its own meaning. That's that's how symbolic interactions are going to view small groups. If, if you get the end, if you're a member of NASW and you get the NASW news this past month, there was a NASW news had an article on the use of poetry and therapy. And one of the uh, professors, one of the professionals that was quoted in the, in fact, his, his picture is there is Nick Mazza, who was actually one of my professors. He did, he was my group process uh, instructor, my group therapy instructor or whatever, in my master's training at Florida State. And he went on to be dean of the school and he's since become dean emeritus and everything. So it was a long time ago, but he was teaching us in the early days of, I think, of his developing poetry therapy. And and, and he demonstrated a way where, you know, he just basically write the first line of a poem, whatever it is that, you know, he kind of, you can kind of guide the where the group goes with it as, as you start it out, but then throw it out to the group. And then everybody in the group kind of adds a line or whoever wants to adds a line and the group constructs this poem together which the leader can use to to elucidate the group process and to um, and to help under other individuals understand what's what's going on with the group another way of using symbols to to um, to explain group process a theory about status characteristics and expectation states it basically says that uh, the influence of group members, especially during the early interactions in a group, are related to status and expectations that the other people in the group have about their ability to help accomplish the group's tasks. Status characteristics are, are any characteristics that are evaluated in a broader society to be associated with confidence. So say, for instance, that, you know, a person is very well spoken um, and, and uh, you know, can can describe things very well or the person's very warm and and can connect with others you know very reassuringly these individuals have these characteristics and because they display them in the group then other group members kind of expect them kind of turn to them to kind of help them uh, to lead the group basically um, then there the few status characteristics are mentioned in the text that tend to relate to the members power and prestige in the group connected to their status in the outside world. And this involves things like race, gender, and educational level, and those kinds of things. Performance expectations, I, you know, it's kind of similar, I think, but these are the expectations group members have of other members in terms of how they will act or behave in a group and how well they will perform a task influenced by their status characteristics. So so the characteristics are recognized by members early in the group and then these expectations of their performance going to develop around them because of that. And, and uh, generally speaking, people play to those expectations. Um, Self-fulfilling stereotypes tend to be created when people rely on their, their stereotypes in the absence of proof that those characteristics are irrelevant. Um, it's probably true about stereotypes in general that when we see somebody, we I think this is probably talking about diffuse status characteristics in particular, you know, but, it, you know, I, I think that's probably who, what it refers to mostly, you know, so that, uh, you know, we have expectations of individuals based on those stereotypes and and uh, until we have proof otherwise, you know, we're going to continue to expect that. And, you know, unfortunately, that that creates a self-fulfilling prophecy in many cases. 
Um, exchange theory looks at the, you know, costs and rewards of interactions between people. That's that's sort of what it does. And so, uh, power, social power determines who gets valued resources in a group and whether the resources are perceived as being distributed in a just manner. And so, conflicts in a group may revolve around um, who wants power, who has power. Uh, who doesn't want to give it up when they do have power? Who wants power but doesn't have it? Um, who doesn't want others to have power over them? Those kinds of things. And and uh, uh, there's uh, you know there's a lot of a lot of struggle can go on around around that kind of uh, power, particularly in small groups. And and in small groups, a lot of times social power arises within the context of the group that is not always based on the innate qualities of its members. So in a sense, that's a little bit, a little bit opposed to the status characteristics and expectations uh, status theory that we had talked about earlier. But uh, um, equity in the group is based upon different kinds of cultural values and self-interest and relationships and personal characteristics of individuals. And again, those expectations, um, those evaluations can really conflict with each other. So it's another thing that can make a group very complex and something that requires the attention of, of a leader. Um, finally, uh, self-categorization theory um, it takes the social social identity theory and suggests that in this process we begin to divide ourselves up into in groups and out groups and I think the definition is fairly clear what an in group and an out group is but uh, we are more likely to agree with members of in groups and to be influenced by members of in groups than by those in out groups and we give more credence to people who are similar to us to us if you if you have any doubt about this taking it well I think actually social media is is a bit of a group environment if you have any doubts about in groups and out groups and their power think about the debates um, that go on in Facebook feeds for instance uh, you know and and the divide in particular these days between the left and the right in, in those feeds and how how um, you know how readily we might respond to the comments made by people who agree with us, and how readily we may respond negatively to those who have the opposite. That's in-group and out-group stuff, and and uh, it, it's a very difficult thing to to get past these days, it seems. And you know, Hitler uh, did it, uh, and I just want to say that Hitler did a very good job of making use of in-groups and out-groups. Uh, to gain power in the, in the years leading up to uh, World War II. And, there's, and there have been some very, very interesting studies about the power of, of in-groups and out-groups uh, done at, at uh, places like summer camps and things like this, if you look it up and you can read about it. It just goes to show how powerful that influence is. And combining other theories here if if an individual is a high status member and in an in group you're going to have more influence over a person than a low status member in your in group or a high status member in an out group probably common sense so very very superficial look at small groups i'm afraid to say it, it's a if you ever get an opportunity to to take a class on, on group uh, techniques and group dynamics, be sure to do it because it really is a, it's a great professional development uh, to, uh, you know, for your career. And so taking this section of the chapter and looking at implications for social work practice, uh, when you're assessing individuals, first of all, look at the small groups to which the person or the family belongs. And well, okay, well, they could be involved therapy groups, but it's probably going to involve more like groups in the community, um, and and um, assess the the um, you know the place of those groups in the person's your client's life as well as you know the client's role in that group and and uh, consider making use of those groups perhaps in in your interventions. Um, in, in your assessment process, determine whether a group modality or some other intervention would be more appropriate for your client. Not everybody should be in a group, but some people are going to be more uh, more influenced by groups. 
Be aware of the different groups in your community to use for networking and referral purposes. Um, consider using small groups, developing a small group when um, you have a population that would benefit from, from that. If, of course, if it's within the definition of your role in, in the community. And this would include things like prevention groups. And finally, in groups that you do facilitate, be, be aware of the stated and unstated purposes and functions of the group. And, uh, and, and mind you, stated and unstated. <laughs> and pay attention to group structure, development, composite, composition, and dynamics. You know, watch the process and what's going on there. And, and um, you know, you'll have a more effective group in the end. So that's uh, that's all I have to say about this particular topic. Uh, I hope that there was some useful information here for you. And as always, uh, let me know if there's if there are questions or comments about this presentation. Thank you.